in sports, the scoreboard doesn't tell the full story, but Netflix does. Stories about dads who happen to be world-class quarterbacks and a battle for the heart, soul, and direction of the multi-billion dollar business of F1. Whether you're a diehard fan or you're brand new, Netflix has the stories for every type of fan. You can watch these incredible sports stories like quarterback, F1 Drive to Survive, Untold, and many more now on Netflix. Hello and welcome to a new podcast, The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello and welcome to this special episode of The Paddock and the Pavilion. On the 12th of March 1977, England played Australia in the centenary test at the Melbourne Cricket Ground. And today's guest, Rick McCosker, opened the batting for the home side in this iconic match. The match soon became a game to remember for Rick, a painful one at that, after he suffered a broken jaw after 30 minutes of play, opening the batting in the first innings. Rick later showed extreme bravery in returning to bat in the second innings. I spoke to Rick at his home in Newcastle, New South Wales, about his international career of Ashes battles, a World Cup final and Packer super tests, and his major life and career change in 2012. Don't forget to send in those Grand National questions for Richard Pittman and enjoy today's podcast. Hello, Rick. Good evening. Delighted to speak to you on the paddock and the pavilion. Good evening, Stephen. Lovely to speak to you. Well, what's life been like in Newcastle uh, since, well, for the last 12 months? Last 12 months, nothing much has changed and not certainly not as much as what's been happening in the UK. Um, we've had very little, if any, um, restrictions as far as um, you know, the COVID restrictions go. So for us, us being my wife and I, we've just sort of basically kept our head down. We haven't, uh, haven't done too much out of the ordinary, <clears throat> haven't, uh, haven't been able to go anywhere, unfortunately. We have family in France, uh, family in New Zealand and in Melbourne. So we haven't been able to visit any of those, any of our family. So um, that's, that's been the toughest for us. Um, we haven't had any close connection to uh, the ca- coronavirus personally here in Newcastle. So we've been very lucky. Well, that's good news. We're still in a in a lockdown here. Now, as an ex-player and a former selector, do you still follow the game of cricket closely? Um, yeah, fairly closely. Uh, certainly test matches. I do in international matches. Our Sheffield Shield, our, our interstate competition. Been following that, and New South Wales um, won the uh, the Sheffield Shield last season, and they're coming second this season. So that's always of interest to me because that's the the stepping stone for our Test team. So it's always a very important competition. Watched with interest uh, the Test series against India, and uh, although I can't say I enjoyed it all that much, but um, had to be have to admit that I was very impressed with the Indian team and by their the way that they were able to uh, come back from just come back from from all the injuries that they had uh, to key players and uh, the loss of their their captain and just their um, yeah, just their resilience and um, the way they were able to commit to a very 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 good team performance. And uh, I'm just you know, very impressed uh, and had to, um, had, you know, we have to respect how good they were, how good they played. And um, it was, and I think it's a sign of how good this Indian team and their, their squad is and will be probably for quite some time by the look of it. Yeah, as an Englishman, we, we probably not want to speak about uh how good India are at the moment. So they seem to have good bowlers in both spin yeah. and pace. Yeah, correct. Um, yeah, so at, what it, at present it's uh, 2-1 to India on the, in your series, is that correct? That's right, yeah. Yeah, so we've been getting that uh, on, on our pay TV here in uh, in Australia and I've uh, been watching the uh, these test matches with interest. Can't believe how much um, spin, wickets, particularly the last test match, 
um, for the match to be completed in two days. That's just incomprehensible. Right, you're moving moving on to your own sort of cricketing career. Now, you're born in a bush mining town. Bush, how, bush mining town. How, how small was it? The town was actually, um, well, it was more of a, I was actually on a, um, grew, grew up on a sheep farm. And so our our uh, our farm was around about five thousand acres in in area, which is not big by by Australian standards. But um, that's that's where I initially grew up until I was about twelve. We moved into to town uh, a town called Inverell, northern New South Wales, which has a population around about fifteen thousand people. Um, a lovely town, lovely people. And that's that's where I started playing cricket uh, during my high school days, and um, then play. I started to play against um, the in the senior competition against older men um, while while I was still at school. And then you moved to Sydney when you were twenty one to work for a bank. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. I was actually employed in a bank in my hometown in Royal, and in those days it was um, you know, quite a good job in in towns and so I worked there for two or three years and then got transferred to Sydney when I was when it was suggested that I move to Sydney and try and um, see if I could um, go further in 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 cricket Um, I didn't particularly want to I didn't particularly want to leave my hometown but that was the only way that I could work out I could find out whether I was going to go any further or not so that was just before I turned 21. And then uh, six years later, you made your state debut for New South Wales against yeah. South Australia. Correct. Yeah. It took me a while uh, because I think boy from the bush going into the big city, uh, I found it very difficult to come to terms with that. And so it, it took that, that long for me to get to the stage where I was ready for, um, uh, to play for my state. And uh, and I was ready at that time. So even though I was a little bit older than than some, um, I I think that was an advantage because um, physically and and mentally and emotionally I was I was ready to play from the state. So it happened. First game was against South Australia on the Sydney Quick Ground, and uh, at that stage we had a system called bonus points, and it was designed to try and encourage teams to. Um, to declare after after 80 overs and you were given uh, bonus points for certain things. So at that point in time, I was batting at number six and had to go in and uh, basically had to pretty much just log straight away as if it was a 2020 game, but there was no 2020 at that stage. So it was a difficult situation for me to go into. But from there, uh, I moved up the order and spent quite some time um, at number three. And um, that's where I started to, to score some hundreds. And um, from there, uh, I was selected in the Australian team. And uh, again, Stephen, I was very fortunate because I was selected at the right time. Yeah. And not every player, not every player who gets selected for their country is selected at the right time. Um, some before... They are ready, and some at a past the time they were ready. But for me, it was just the right time, and I'd scored a few hundreds, and uh, so I got selected. Well, the first test, which was the Nashes test again. Now just uh, to go was, back, yes. you, you you say you scored a few. So just to go back, you said you scored a few hundreds. Well, you scored four consecutive centuries in the Sheffield Shield, and then got selected to, for Australia in the. Uh, 74, 75. Well, it was the 1975. And this was at uh, Sydney as well, wasn't it? The test debut. That's right. Correct. Yeah. It was actually uh, 11.30 on Saturday morning, the 4th of January, 1975. You remember it well then. <laughs> <laughs> I just happen to remember it well. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's all very, um, very important the first time you represent your country. And for me, I'll, I'll always remember that day. And you were joining a, an Australian team full of some very famous players, Rodney Marsh, Dennis Lilly, the Chapel Brothers, mm. Doug Walters. Um, yep. You were 2-0 up in the series. Uh, 
What yeah. was the England side? How how did they come across that? Because they were having injuries, people were coming and going. Mm. Well, I think at that stage they had a little bit of shell shock um, from the barrage that they'd uh, had from uh, Dennis Lilly and Jeff Thompson. They were uh, it was a tough time for them, and um, they had actually they had some injuries, and um, they had uh, brought out Colin Cowdery from England, um, who was probably towards the end of his career. But it's a, he was he was amazing. He just stood up to the to the fast bowlers and got hit everywhere. But he um, he was just you know, a lot of courage, and um, you know he played played some good shots. But it was it was tough for the English team because they were down in the series, and um, we had um, a very very good all round Test side. So uh, he, they they were really really feeling feeling it uh, by the time we got to Sydney for the fourth Test. So how how quick was Tomo? Tomo was quick, um, and in a way a bit nasty. Not not nasty because he he, he was trying to hit people, but nasty because of the, his action, and uh, because he was he could get uh, such a lot of pace and bounce off the wicket, and that made him different, and he had a different action, so that made him difficult to bat against. And um, I had to bat against him many times um, playing in Sheffield Shield and for New South Wales versus Queensland. And he was tough. Um, and he was quick. Um, probably not, not really any quicker than Dennis Lilly or even, say, Bob Willis. But he was just different. That different extra bounce that he could get off the wicket made, made him a bit more, I guess, dangerous from a uh, physical point of view. Well, you had a successful series, averaging 40, scoring over 200 runs. And then you were then selected for your first Ashes tour in 1975, which, like 2019, also included a World Cup year. So I just wanted to start by talking about the World Cup, which in that year, 1975, was played over just two weeks a uh, far cry from from now nowadays with World Cups. Uh, <clears throat> it was a tough was few weeks. What was it like playing in a in a World oh, Cup? Look, look, it was very exciting because it was the first one, and uh, we before the first game, uh, we all the teams were invited to um, have afternoon tea with um, uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth at Buckingham Palace. So that was all very exciting, particularly for me, um, first time in England. And, and a few days after we arrived, we found ourselves at Buckingham Palace. So it was pretty exciting. But um, the competition was was fairly new to us. We hadn't played much one-day cricket. So um, we we had quite a bit to learn. But um, we had, uh, had a couple of good games and uh, particularly uh, magnificent uh, Performance by Gary Gilmore against England in the Headingley semi-final against England. Um, oh, I didn't think you'd forget that one. No, no, not at all. Look, I was there that day, and that was probably the best bit of spring bowling I have ever seen at any time. It was just magnificent. And on top of that, we we were in trouble in our innings, and he came out and uh, he got twenty six to twenty eight in no time, and and won the game for us. So that got us into the final against West Indies. And so we thought we were doing pretty well to uh, for our first um, World Cup to get into the final, but um, in in the end we were, were outplayed by West Indies. Um, I had such a great team, and in the end it was probably a bit closer than we thought it would be. It um, they, they beat us by seventeen runs, but uh, they, were, they were just too good on the day. I mean that was one of the most famous one day cricket matches, even. To this day, with Clive Lloyd scoring that a yeah. hundred, yeah. Rowan Canhai getting fifty. Yeah, yeah. Clive Lloyd that day was brutal. Uh, I remember fielding fielding on the fence that cover uphill from you know what like it's like at Lords, an uphill, and he smashed one to the covers, and uh, I only had just the time to bend down, and the ball was on me. So if it had been a yard either either side of me, I would not have been able to field it. He was just battered with so much power. And then their fielding was brilliant. Um, Viv Richards just, just kept hitting the stumps and running our guys out. So, yeah, it was a memorable match. And, and um, having such a, uh, a large West Indian 
crowd. Um, it was, yeah, it was obviously an away game for us and a home game for West Indies. But besides that, it was just so exciting. Uh, so, um, so much noise and excitement from the crowd. They, they absolutely loved it. Yeah, it's interesting you said about Clive Lloyd. I actually last night looked up his strike rate and uh, we, everyone talks about strike rates now. And his strike rate in that game was 120, which would be mm. good even today, you know. That's right. Yeah, in those days, it was phenomenal because uh, we're all sort of trying to work out how do we play this, um, you know, this limited over cricket. And uh, But he, I think he learned quicker than most of us. Yeah, your strike rate was 29, actually. I did check that as well. But, uh, I think it was seven runs. Seven, yeah. Caught, you were caught. Caught, um, caught and slip off. Ke- oh, caught Kamacharan and bowled Keith Boyce, Kalacharan. yeah. At least, at least you weren't run out. True. Yeah. Yep. So uh, yeah, it was. It was my own way of getting out. Uh, I didn't want to be the same as the other guys. No. And then, of course, we had the the Ashes of of seventy five, um, a series that the Australians won one nil by winning the first Test at uh, Edgbaston. Um, yeah. But you have painful memories a bit from the tour because in the Headingley Test uh, you were ninety five not out overnight, and then the pitch was vandalised and. You were prevented from the chance of scoring a, an Ashes century. Yeah, that's true. But what what was worse was the fact that um, we were written off by the English press that um, that we had no one in the world we were able to get the runs. We we were four down, and we only, we needed about another two hundred runs, and um, we were written off by the English press. And um, so we were pretty determined um, that we were going to get those runs, but. As it turned out, even if the uh, pitch hadn't been vandalised, we wouldn't have got them anyway because next day it basically rained all day. So we may may not even have got on uh, at the beginning. So you know, I would never know whether um, whether I was that was going to be my first century or not, um, and whether we were going to be able to to bat and make history and, and um, win the Test match. But so because the weather decided to take a hand and that was it anyway. But you got a century in the the uh, final test at the Oval, which was a, a six-day test match. You'd, we'd get three games in that nowadays. <laughs> if England That's right, but you, would, you wouldn't get three games on that Oval wicket in, in 1975 um, because the summer was such a hot, dry one. Uh, it was perfect for, for batting and um, you were difficult for fast bowlers, but that wicket at the Oval, that last test was just so flat, and it was it was amazing actually that we were able to bowl out England in the first innings. But our mistake then was to to send England back in back in on the second innings, and then we fielded for the next five days, um, thanks to amongst others for Bob Woolman. Um He just batted forever, and John Edridge too. But um, it, it was yeah, it was memorable for me because I had a long uh, partnership with uh, with my captain, uh, Ian Chapel. He got a hundred as well, and um, so we uh, we batted from about the second over, I think it was, for the rest of that day, and then into the second day, in our partnership. So um, I really really enjoyed batting. Uh, really enjoyed getting my first hundred and batting with with Ian. Um, uh, yeah, that was good and. Uh, yeah, it was it was um, an innings and a day that I won't forget. It was a very successful tour for you. You got over four hundred runs in mm. the Test matches, and and actually got over a thousand runs on the tour, which would be impossible uh, these days. So. Yeah, yeah. Look, it was, but sort of. I, and again, it was it was such a, a hot, dry summer. It was you know, perfect for particularly opening batsmen. Um, it wasn't uh, it wasn't the the type of summer and conditions that we were to find two years later in 77 it was completely different but yeah um yeah look i just, just so much enjoyed england um i enjoyed the whole the whole part of it my mother actually originally came from england she was uh, come from derbyshire from derby and i had an auntie still living in england and so for me it was uh it was wonderful just to be able to see parts of england that i wouldn't have ever seen otherwise and to spend some time with my auntie and go back to where 
the um, the city where my mother was born and where she met my father during the war. So it was all very interesting for me. Oh, that must have been interesting because I I read that your father was um, in a, in bomber command during World War Two. That's right. Yeah, he was a pilot, a uh, pilot of um, Halifax bombers, and um, yeah, they he was um, stationed somewhere near where where my mom's. I wasn't quite exactly quite sure. He, did, he never never talked to us much about those war times, um, but they met. I think. They met at a dance at the local hall somewhere or other, and that's how it all started. And um, they got married during the war, and um, then Mum came out to Australia uh, with a lot of a uh, lot of English war brides. Actually, there was quite a quite a number of them, and uh, came out after the war uh, finished. Yeah, there was there was quite a number of them came out, and um, my mother very difficult time for her because she moved from um, Derby in the middle of winter and she arrived in Australia on New Year's Day um, and <laughs> middle of summer in, and um, went from, um, from Perth to Sydney and then from Sydney to northern New South Wales uh, in the, uh, on the farm where Dad was, Dad was working in the first couple of days of January in the middle of summer. So it was uh, a bit of a contrast a bit, a, there. A bit of a contrast for my mother, yeah. Well, thank you for that. That's very interesting. Uh, we could have had you opening the batting for England. Um, well, you could have, but my father would have had something to say about that. Well, we've had quite a few Australians now uh, of sorts playing for England, so you could have been one of those. Like, um, <laughs> but to, moving on, you... Talking about battles, you then played in the centenary test between England and Australia, on, which started on the 12th of March, 1977. That must have been a memorable occasion to play in with people like Don Bradman, yeah. Keith Miller being in attendance at the game. It was. It was absolutely amazing. And uh, just the atmosphere built, uh, leading, up to the, uh, leading up to the match was uh, amazing in itself. Where there were so many uh, dinners and receptions and so much uh, promotion about the game, a um, lot of hype in radio and TV, and um, and just the the opportunity to see and meet up with so many ex-Test players, not only the Australians but the English players as well, ones that uh, were just names prior to that, and so it was just an amazing atmosphere even. What it did was uh, built up this, um, you know, tremendous pressure, I guess, on us as players uh, because it was a test match against England and it was going to be in front of test players, ex-test players from both Australia and England. And so it was going to be, yeah, or obviously it was a huge occasion, but an occasion where we had to, to a certain extent, put that beside us, behind us, and focus on the game itself. And that was very difficult to do, especially in the first morning when there's all the hype and the captains, ex-English and Australian captains, were all paraded out on the ground and introduced to the crowd and we were introduced to the crowd and and there were 60 or 70,000 people at the MCG. So <clears throat> and then to for our captain, Greg Chappell, to lose the toss and we were asked to to bat and to go out on that first morning and it was I could you know you could feel that everybody was tense and uh, there was excitement everywhere so it was <clears throat> no real surprise to us that both teams weren't able to settle down on those first two days and so ne- neither team were able was able to uh, to get into a good rhythm and and uh, and get you know get partnerships going so yeah, it was, it was exciting. It was uh, fantastic just to be part of this amazing occasion. And a dramatic match, of course, for you, We being a dismissed bold, but um, breaking your jaw in the process <laughs> from, from Bob Willis. Mm. How long did you spend in, in hospital during the game? Uh, but, uh, the, from the end of that first day, uh, it took a while for the doctors to realise that things weren't 
<clears throat> weren't, weren't quite so good. Uh, towards the end of the day and then for the next two days. And um, so I came out, <clears throat> was back in the dressing room on the third day of the match. So, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't too bad. So, But the worst part about that first day was actually the fact that um, the ball hit the stumps and I was out. And, um, and that sort of probably hurt more than anything at that time. At that time, uh, and it wasn't until later when um, when the numbness started to wear off that um, yeah things started to hurt a bit. And then you famously came back to bat in the uh, second innings, batting at number ten. And it, of course, we're pre helmet days. Who, right. who whose decision was it to to bat again? Was that yours or it was mine? Um, but I, I asked um, our captain Greg Greg Chapel. Uh, that I uh, told him that I would like to bat if, if that was possible. And he said, well, look, um, you know the risks, it's your decision. Um, and in fact, we, I, I thought it was important for a couple of reasons for me to, to go out because at that point in time, um, our wicketkeeper Rod Marsh was approaching the century. Um, this would have been you know, a fantastic milestone for him to get a century in the centenary test. And we're running out of wickets. And uh, we also realised that we needed more runs um, because England had a very good batting side. Uh, the wicket was um, a very good batting wicket by that stage. And the other, the other reason was that um, I I hadn't, apart from the first half hour, 40 minutes, I hadn't taken part in any part at all in this fantastic match. So I wanted to, to be out there to be part of it, to do something, and to try and do something worthwhile for the team. And just to, to be out there and absorb the the atmosphere, and uh, there were still sixty seventy thousand people there in the ground every day, and so that was uh, and there was no no decision really. I was I was just one of those things. But um, reflecting on that today, there's no way in the world I'd be allowed to go back out today um, with all the um, protocols, uh, no. have all the protocols that take place now. Um, there's no there's no way it would happen but um at the time i didn't feel in any particular danger partly because the wicket was so flat and the english bowlers had been in the field for more than a day um they were you know relatively tired and been a hot day so i, I didn't really feel in in any particular physical danger and i wanted to get out there and and contribute uh, to the, this to this match well, your uh, 25 runs um, and the partnership with Rodney Marsh, despite England's batting in the second innings with Derek Randall's 174, mm. Australia managed to win by 45 runs. So Correct. you did make a difference. <laughs> we did. Yeah, the partnership was 55. I mean, we'll never, we'll never know what would have happened had, had I not gone out and we didn't have that partnership. We might still have won anyway. Who knows? But... Um, it was just uh, an amazing, and we didn't realise until afterwards in the dressing room, re- reflecting on the result and realising that um, it was the same result as the original Test match a hundred years previous. And um, it, um, yeah, it, it was a cause for uh, our joker Doug Walters to comment that in a hundred years, English cricket has, hasn't learned a thing. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, so there have been no, no change in 100 years of uh, England's Australian cricket. So we all thought that was pretty clever at the time. After the centenary test, then you came on your second Ashes tour to England. And I was only reading earlier today that it was May the 9th when it was leaked that the Packer series was going to start. Uh, did that development affect the performance of the Australian team and were there some divisions in the side because some people weren't in the Packer series during that tour? To be honest, I think, yes, there probably was. Um, we probably didn't realise to the full extent at that time. Um, our team in 77 was nowhere near the same team as two years previously in 75. Um, it was a lot less um, experienced and there was 
there were two or three members of the team who hadn't been contracted to World Series cricket. And whilst we we tried very hard to allow that to have, have an effect, I think it was very difficult not to have have some effect. And I think in the end it did. Um, our, apart from Greg Chappell, um, our performances were, were pretty ordinary, particularly myself. But it was very difficult summer. Well, it wasn't a summer. It was colder and wetter than, than our winter um, in 77. It was a dreadful season in England. And so it was very difficult, particularly for an opening batsman, and uh, to, play, to bat under those conditions. That was that was my excuse. But um, other, the other things were, you know, for me personally, um, I, I was about uh, two weeks late in meeting up with the um, with the team, partly because I had to wait an extra week to uh, have the wire screens taken out of uh, out of my mouth. And then I was about to board, board a plane in Sydney to fly to London and um, there was a air controller strike and so I had to wait another week. So I was two weeks behind everybody and so by the time I got there, it, I was, you know, I was basically behind the eight ball trying to catch up and um, not having been able to do any physical activity for nearly two months prior to that. It was I had a lot of catching up to do. It took me until about the was it the third test and uh, a county game just prior to that to to start scoring some runs. So, so for me personally, it wasn't a good tour. I didn't obviously didn't enjoy it as much as seventy five for lots of reasons. You did get a, a century at Trent Bridge, which was a um, pretty significant game when it was Jeff Boycott's return to Test cricket. It was Ian Botham's oh. first um, Test yes. match and. That's and right. the first the first ball that Ian Botham bowled in a test match was to yourself. Um, yeah, you know, I can't recall that. But yeah, um, I've, I've, that, I've checked that, and, it, and it's actually <laughs> it's actually in Ian Botham's book because Ian Botham I'll makes comment. He went. He makes comment that um, uh, you put the ball through third slip, and he should have had a third slip. Ah, uh, he would have. He would have been meant to go there. I wouldn't have. Uh, 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 it was guided through uh, there, yeah, yeah. Yeah, guided, yeah, that's correct, yeah. But I think um, yeah, uh, initially, unfortunately, I don't think we, the the, the batsman in our Australian side, um, realised how good Ian Botham was. And um, he certainly you know, found us out very quickly and um, had, a, had a very good, um, uh, a very good test match, very good test debut and obviously a fantastic career. Um, we took him a little bit lightly, I think, in that in that first Test match. But uh, unfortunately, um, Jeff Boycott, he should have been out probably in the first session um, of Danny Pascoe. He was dropped in second slip um, by yours truly. So I remember that. Unfortunately, uh, so he got a hundred in that in that innings. He, we lost that Test match. He got a hundred in uh, Headingley. We lost that test match, and so we lost the Ashes. Um, so it wasn't uh, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, a very pleasant time for us. Well, then you went home, and uh, you then obviously played in the Super Tests, as they were called. Was it an easy decision to sign up for Packer? Were you still working for the bank then as well? I was, and it wasn't an easy decision. Um, I think, um, well... The, the financial aspect uh, was part of it, but not the major aspect. Um, for me, um, by the time, because I was, I wasn't one of the, um, you know, the most important um, members of the Australian team. I knew that if I was, had been um, asked to join, to, to sign a contract, I wouldn't have been the first one. So I knew that, that um, if I'd been asked, then a whole lot of other people were, and it was going to happen anyway. I wanted to be able to play uh, with and against the best players in the world, and um, that was it. That I feel that's the only way that you can really gauge how good you are if you are any good at all. And so that's what I wanted to do. The, the financial aspect um, was, um, yeah, it was important, I guess, because at that point in time, 
I was married with two young boys and uh, living in Sydney, uh, had a, a, a position in the bank, um, which wasn't all that brilliantly well paid, but um, trying to maintain that employment uh, while at the same time being asked to play more and more international cricket by Australian Cricket Board. So, um, so in the end, before I left England, left for England in the 77 tour after the centenary test, I'd made the decision to, uh, to join. And, uh, but it was mainly because I wanted to play with and against the best players in the world. Um, and, um, yeah, look, it was, it was a decision. I look back on it and think, well, if I decided not to join, what would have happened? Um, would I have still been selected for Australia? Um, where where would have all where would have my career have gone? I don't really know. But in hindsight, uh, I was very happy for have to have made the decision, even though those two years in World Series were the toughest two years of cricket um, that I'd, that I've been involved in, and uh, every game was an international game. You had no no uh, club games to fall back on, no state games to fall back on. We weren't we were ostracised. Uh, from our teammates, from our club mates, and so we we're completely on our own. So it was difficult times, but um, in hindsight, I believe I made the right decision. Well, thank you for that. It was very interesting because one of my questions was how tough was the cricket, and you just explained that. And uh, like I, you probably do know this fact, but you did uh, face the first ball in Super Test cricket. I did. I did. Yeah. And yeah. to follow on from that, I was the first batsman out in <laughs> court. So I think might have been called Viv Richards, bowled Andy Roberts or something like that. But now it was Andy Roberts. So that's that's not something that um, I was too pleased about. But just on on facing first ball, you've mentioned that twice. Uh, as it turned out, when I look back, in the 1975 tour of England, I faced the first uh, ball in the Ashes series. Um, and I faced the last ball in the Ashes series, so the first ball at Edgebaston and the last ball at the Oval um, when we were batting in our second innings. So, um, yeah, first and last. Um, yeah, that, <laughs> I'm not sure whether that that's re- very relevant, but for me it's, it's something anyway. Well, you came back and played for Australia after the Packer series. Um... And you made your final test appearance again against England on the 1st of February, 1980. You captain New South Wales to the Sheffield Shield final in March, 1983. Um, right. Were you ready to retire then in uh, 1984? Yeah, at the end of the 1984 season, I stood down as New South Wales captain and just um, played as a player. And um, I felt at the end of that season that I was ready. Partly from a physical point of view, I found it uh, difficult. I um, mean, the, the pre-season training, middle of winter out here, not a lot of fun. So I thought, well, maybe there is other things that I could be doing. Besides, at that stage, um, I, I I really wanted to to start playing tennis, um, playing competition tennis. Tennis was my first love. And I really enjoyed that, and uh, finished up you know, playing uh, tournaments and um, and in the um, uh, vets in New South Wales veterans tournaments. So I really enjoyed that for uh, probably for a number of years. So and besides that, I had a young family, I had a business uh, that I needed to spend more time with, and um, I just felt that the time was right. So your business career continued after cricket and then you made a complete career change in 2012 when you became the Catholic chaplain to the port of Newcastle. How did that come about? Mm, That's a good question. I'm still wondering how it happened. But um, yeah, 2000 and year before, 2012, I actually retired from my business, had a financial planning business. And I retired from there and I was just finishing up a uh, th- three-year Christian formation course and uh, throughout our church. And um, 
at the end of that, I was I was just at the stage where I was thinking, well, what now? What happens now? And um, I really had nothing on the horizon, nothing definite. And uh, so I was wondering, well, where do I go from here? And uh, just at that time, uh, I was approached and a tap, and I had the actual tap on the shoulder. And um, I was asked, would I uh, consider uh, becoming the Catholic chaplain at the Port of Newcastle? And at that stage, I had absolutely no idea what that was all about. Um, and so, but I thought, well, this is something I really should have a look at because I, nothing else was happening at the time. So I went, I spent a week there, and I thought at the end of that, this is something that I think is very worthwhile, something I could really become involved in and do something uh, definitely worthwhile for others. How and, big a uh, port is Newcastle? Well, Newcastle is the biggest and the um, busiest coal exporting port in the world. Um, so because we have, within New South Wales, got a, a, there's a, a coal uh, is a very big industry and uh, the export to mainly to Asian countries is, uh, is immense. And um, we, we get um, on average about 50,000 um, visiting seafarers coming to our port every year, um, anything up to about 10 or 12 every week. And um, so my job as chaplain was to uh, to do. Uh, we have a t- have a team here in Newcastle. Um, we have a a mission centre, and our role was my role was to try and do whatever I could to make the life of the seafarer a little bit better. Um, very tough life. They mainly came from come from uh, Asian countries, predominantly Philippines. Uh, underpaid, overworked. Um, very uh, dangerous work they do and um, very very rarely could they get off their vessel so part of our part of my role was to actually go on board and visit them and if if possible to spend some time with the uh, ship captain because he could very rarely ever get off off the off the vessel and he was under a lot of pressure so in Newcastle when they they arrived because we got um, very good um, coal loader facilities the vessels might have traveled 15 or 16 days from china arrived in newcastle may only be in in the port for 18 hours and then turn around and, and go back to china again or to um you know to vietnam or wherever so we didn't know we had very limited time to do what we could so part of that time we would go on board we would encourage the captain to allow some of his crew to come come ashore and we would have mini buses that would uh, go to the wharf, pick up the seafarers, bring them into the mission centre, take them down to our shopping centre, do shopping and just be part of part of a human community again. And uh, so that was very important for us. And, uh, but, and for me as a chaplain, I was able to on – during my time as chaplaincy, probably about 12 or 15 times to be able to arrange a Catholic mass service on board for a Filipino crew. And that was very important for them um, because uh, they're very, very um, strong Catholic faith, most of them. And it was very important that they were able to provide, take a priest on board and be able to have a Catholic service for them, particularly if they'd arrived in, in Newcastle and they'd been incidents on board the ship um which often with well not often but some quite or sometimes there'd been either a death on board uh or there'd been a suicide um a a seafarer had had enough and just decided to jump overboard Um, those sort of things were happening and so it was very difficult for us to be able to to do much for them in a very short period of time so we could just do whatever we could for them to try and make their life just that little bit better. So it's a bit more difficult now, uh, as you can appreciate, Stephen, with um, coronavirus. And you're still volunteering difficult. now, aren't you? You're still volunteering We are now. still volunteering, yeah. myself yeah. and my wife. We volunteer. Yeah. Um, I spent about five years as chaplain. But now we still volunteer and we do whatever we can. But 
um, due to the coronavirus, uh, we're not allowed to uh, go on board the vessel and the seafarers are not allowed to come off, off their vessel. So they're basically imprisoned on their ship and for as long as their, their contracts last and, for how, and until somehow or other they're able to be taken off the vessel and, um, and, and flown home, which in some cases has been you know, 12, 15 months before they're able to get a flight back home. So difficult times for them, but we still do what we can for them. We provide um, personal gift packs for them and uh, the port, port authorities and border force allow us to take those gift packs out to the wharf and uh, um, leave them on the wharf. The seafarers come down and pick them and take the board. So uh, a very important time for us is uh, leading up to Christmas. During the, the week, um, during the Christmas week, we're able to deliver to their wharves 1,100 individual personal gift packs, Christmas packs. So for every seafarer that came into the port for about a week or 10 days, we were able to give them a, a gift pack at Christmas time. Not much, but at least it was something uh, because these seafarers were not going to be able to see their family get home for Christmas. So it was just a little something that we could do and so it was very important. Important for them and very important for us that we were able to do this. Now, it sounds like you uh, get great jobs, job satisfaction yourself out of helping people. Um, we do. Yeah, and we just so feel so um, sorry, I guess, for the seafarers because um, having been able to, to speak with them different times over the years, we get a bit of an understanding of what they go through. And um, their time on board the vessels is, is very hard for them particularly if they're on board with a say a crew of 20 and the officers may be Chinese perhaps and the crew may be Filipino or Myanmar uh, completely different cultures different food they eat different lifestyles but they have to live with it for, for however long they're on board the ship so um, sometimes we hear of physical bullying cultural bullying um so we have to if we hear of that we have to be very careful how we deal with that because whilst they're in port they're safe but 300 miles out to sea they're on their own so whilst they're here if we hear of something we have to take it very uh secretly to a government authority here in newcastle called amsa which is the australian maritime safety authority and allow them to deal with it they have the authority to retain a vessel if they feel that circumstances strong enough that they should um, retain the vessel until something is uh, you know, fixed. Well, that was that was very interesting. It's uh, obviously something you, you really enjoy doing and you're obviously doing some very valuable work there. Very different from opening the batting on a, on a dodgy wicket or a fast track at the Wacker. Oh, uh, absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, and occasionally, look, um, you know, when not, we can't now because seafarers can't come in to our mission centre, but quite often we would get a, um, an Indian crew would come in, and um, particularly the, the crew, not so much the officers, but particularly the crew, as soon as you mention the word cricket, their eyes would light up and you could spend the ne- next half hour having a, a conversation with them and talking about, you know, Vera Coley and... Um, I mean, I've asked the question many times as to who they regard as the, the best batsman in the world, and I'm going back a half a dozen years now, and um, and I, I, I would have thought at the time they would have said Sash and Tendulkar, but they immediately they would say Michael Clark, uh, and then they'd say Ricky Ponting. So that was uh, their understanding of how good international cricketers were, not just their, their own from their own country but their knowledge of cricket was amazing and you know they could they could talk about statistics and what happened in this test match and you know all, all those sorts of things so it was, was fun uh, talking to them well um thank you very much for bringing us up to date where and what rick mccosker is doing these days thank you very much for being on the 
paddock and the pavilion. It's been a pleasure. You've got uh, obviously 2021 to look forward to England, England coming to Australia and coming yeah, home she's... with the coming back with the urn, of course. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Did I hear you correctly, Stu? <laughs> Hopefully there won't be two-day test matches in Australia. Um, no, there won't. That that wouldn't happen. But uh, look, um, we're really, we're looking forward here in Australia to the Ashes series. It is always the uh, the pinnacle of uh, international cricket at the moment. Even though India is the number one uh, na- cricket nation from their results, but still, um, the Ashes series uh, is the ultimate as far as uh, well. Certainly from Australian cricketers' point of view. Uh, and for most of our followers as well. So we're looking forward to it. We know it'll be tough. Um, England always have a good team, but we think we might be too good. Well, we'll have to wait and see, won't we? But we thanks will. again. Thanks again for being on the, on the paddock and the pavilion. Thanks. Pleasure, Stephen. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the paddock and the pavilion. You can download the show on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Pad and Pad. Sports Social Podcast Network. Don't forget that your skin is your largest organ and the sun can be your skin's worst enemy. Dermatologist recommended Neutrogena products offer the ultimate protection for your skin. From makeup remover wipes to Hydro Boost Water Gel Facial Moisturizer, BJ's has your entire lineup of Neutrogena skincare products. And now through December 3rd, save $4 on any Neutrogena product at BJ's. Love your skin back and save now through December 3rd, only at BJ's.